Every so often, discoveries are made which challenge conventional historical chronology and thought. These anomalies present questions which, despite extensive research and analysis by experts, cannot always be answered. As such, here are five bizarre discoveries that science has not been able to explain fully. Easter Island, a remote volcanic island in the southeastern Pacific Ocean, is renowned for being a land of mystery. Since it was discovered by Europeans on Easter Sunday 1722, Easter Island has exuded an almost magnetic charm, enchanting the explorers, scholars and missionaries who visited in the decades and centuries that followed. After all, the island's inhabitants lived in one of the loneliest spots in the world with the island's closest inhabited neighbour lying 1,150 miles to the east. Despite such isolation, the tribe's people of Easter Island had managed to build not merely a prosperous society, but one with capabilities far outreaching those comprehensible by both 18th century and present day scientists. Easter Island is most famous for being home to around 900 monumental stone figures called Moai, which were carved any time between the 12th and 17th century AD by the indigenous Rapai Nui people. Yet, it is the so-called talking boards of Easter Island which present greater intellectual excitement for many scientists. A series of wooden tablets covered with glyphs of what is thought to be an unknown language these remarkable treasures were not discovered until about a century and a half after Europeans first landed on the island. It was Father Eugene Eru, a French missionary who was the first to notice the boards, when he observed islanders using the artifacts to build their canoes and as firewood. By the time a salvage operation began, only 21 tablets remained. The surviving glyphs included both pictographic and geometric shapes. Some images appear to depict humans, plants, and animals. With no evidence of a historical written language on neighboring islands, the talking boards represented something of enormous and rare historical significance, a written language which had developed independent of other linguistic influences. However, deciphering the tablets turned out to be far from straightforward. When Father Iro set out to record his discovery in the 1860s, he could find no one on the island able to translate the boards. Easter Island's culture was in decline. In 1862, slave hunters from South America had kidnapped or killed the island's ruling families, leaving behind no one able to read the inscriptions. By the end of the century, Ronga Rongo, as the language is now known, was a dead, indecipherable script. In the years since, many scholars have worked to untangle the enigma of the talking boards. Some linguists have dismissed the markings as cloth printing designs, whilst others have stated that written language on Easter Island couldn't possibly predate European contact, and must have only developed after Spain claimed the island in 1770. Egyptian hieroglyphics and the rock paintings of Australian Aborigines have also been unsuccessfully turned to in attempts to find a connection and thus decipher the tablets. Despite numerous attempts by scholars, the surviving texts have still not been deciphered. If the tablets are indeed examples of written language, the glyphs are wholly unique to Easter Island. It is possible that these mysterious talking boards hold many secrets of an advanced Easter Island civilization, of their language, culture, and incredible engineering ability. Yet, with such a small surviving sample, it is unlikely that any major breakthrough will be made in the future, leaving science in the dark. Since 1739, about 100 peculiar small geometric objects have been discovered across Europe. With 12 flat pentagonal faces, these dodecahedral artifacts have perplexed archaeologists since they were first discovered. Made of either bronze or stone, each face of these strange objects has a circular hole of varying diameter, which connects to a hollow center. Dating from the 2nd to 3rd centuries AD, their intended use has been long forgotten, with the Romans' usually meticulous accounts making no mention of them. 
Regardless, many have guessed at their purpose. A decorative candlestick, some sort of gaming die, a religious symbol, a military device, a child's toy, and even a weather gauge for farming are amongst the many and diverse theorized uses. Their purpose has been widely discussed by experts and amateurs across the globe, without any firm conclusion being reached. The only thing that can be agreed upon is a name for the odd artifact, a Roman dodecahedron. In 2014, one man set about solving the Roman dodecahedron mystery once and for all. Using a 3D printer, Martin Hallett produced a scale replica of a dodecahedron and shared the results of his experiments on YouTube. In his video, he demonstrated that with much patience, the geometric object could be used to make gloves. Yet, far from demystifying the issue, Hallett merely helped to prove just how bizarre the objects are, with many pointing out that there are much simpler and less time-consuming methods of glove making that the Romans could have and most likely would have employed. Not only that, those with knowledge of smithing and metalwork have pointed out that these devices would not be easy to make, and as such would be very expensive, due to the amount of time a highly skilled craftsman would have to put into its creation, as well as the cost of the metal. Surely something which required so much time and monetary investment must have had an important purpose. What that purpose was, however, remains a mystery. In 2015, amateur archaeologist Christian Albertson hit the jackpot. After four Bronze Age gold bracelets were discovered in a field in eastern Denmark, Albertson was invited by a local museum to continue excavating the site. It was hoped that the site, located in an area known to be a rich source of Bronze Age gold artifacts, would yield more finds. And yield, the site did. Around 2,000 tiny gold spirals, each roughly an inch long and about as thin as a human hair, were discovered in one big lump inside the remains of a wooden box lined with fur. Described as a golden enigma in reports at the time, the delicate coils left archaeologists baffled. What were these bizarre gold filaments? And what were they used for? One theory is that the gold spirals may have had a ceremonial purpose for a sun-worshipping cult. After their sensational discovery, an archaeologist from Denmark's National Museum suggested that they could have been woven into a priest king's robes, or used on a ceremonial headpiece. And certainly, the gold threads are as beautiful as they are enigmatic, strengthening the suggestion that the artifacts might have had a divine significance. Interestingly, similar gold spirals were discovered a few years earlier, in 2011, in Germany, during archaeological excavations conducted ahead of the installation of a gas pipeline. Like their Danish equivalents, the gold spirals also posed a mystery to archaeologists. What makes these artifacts so peculiar is the technique which would have been used to create them. The gold spirals were not hammered, but were instead drawn out thus revealing to archaeologists the remarkable and hitherto unknown advanced metalwork abilities of Bronze Age peoples. Not only that, the hoard discovered in Germany was found to contain recycled gold, with the metal having originated from Central Asia, a great distance from Germany. Considering the gold spirals were at least 2,700 years old, this makes them all the more incredible. Yet, as exceptional as they are to behold, the gold spiral's purpose is yet to be fully understood. During an excavation south of Baghdad in 1936, ceramic vases were found containing a copper sheet cylinder pierced by an iron rod. The date of their creation has since been disputed, but it is now generally agreed that the peculiar artifacts are more than 2,000 years old. Yet, what they were used for has eluded experts for decades. One of the most controversial theories is that these vases were actually ancient batteries, 
a place where chemical energy could be converted into electricity and used as a source of power. Indeed, experiments have shown that when similar jars were immersed in an acidic liquid, like lemon juice or vinegar, they can produce a small electric current. This theory was popularized by the Austrian archaeologist Dr. Wilhelm Koenig two years after the vase's discovery when he authored a paper on the subject. In his paper, he also stated that the electricity generated from the bizarre vases could have been used to electroplate precious metals onto various objects. This sensational claim of ancient advanced technology was strengthened in 1980, when a renowned Egyptologist recreated one of the objects and immersed it in grape juice to produce half a volt of electricity. Broadcast on British television, the demonstration also showed how the same setup was able to electroplate a small silver statue in two hours. Yet, as remarkable as all of this seems, experts have counted that not one electroplated object has been found from the ancient world. Instead, objects from the area where the so-called Baghdad battery was found evidence conventionally applied gold and silver. Skeptics argue that, if the bizarre vases were used to electroplate objects, then why is there no surviving evidence of such artifacts? Those in support of the electroplate theory, however, have claimed that, with additional investigation, it is possible that many of the objects displayed in museums across the globe could have been electroplated. In fact, in the 1930s, Koenig, the original author of the theory, stated that many of the objects he had handled whilst working as an assistant in the National Museum of Iraq in Baghdad could have been gilded with electricity. Another theory proposed by researcher Paul T. Kaiser is that the objects could have been used for some sort of electrotherapy. Others have claimed that the batteries might have been used for religious purposes perhaps to give statues static electricity to shock worshippers and reinforce their belief in the power of the gods. The notion of ancient electricity, however, is just too bizarre for many experts to endorse. As such, some state that the vases were not batteries at all, but were merely used to store sacred scrolls, and that the scrolls themselves have rotted away with time, leaving an acidic residue which many mistakenly take as evidence for the vase's use as a battery. Ultimately, there is no consensus, and the general scientific community tends to disregard the objects as anomalies, for pseudo-scientists to speculate on. If it can be proven that the ancient world was able to produce and utilize electricity, then it would revolutionize our understanding of history and the abilities of ancient people. In 1912, a Polish antique book dealer stumbled upon a bizarre artifact. Wilfred Voynich operated one of the largest rare book businesses in the world. However, his vast experience could provide no illumination when presented with an old text so strange that over a century later, it continues to puzzle those who attempt to unravel its mysteries. The Voynich Manuscript, as the Peculiar Codex is now known, was handwritten in an unknown language. Comprising 240 vellum pages, the book not only contains encrypted text, but is also saturated with striking illustrations. The imagery was what first captured Wilfred Voynich's attention, with pictures of unusual spiral forms, fantastical herbs and plants, constellations, and even whimsical illustrations of female figures. Unable to decode the book, Voynich concluded that it must contain volatile information perhaps a discovery in the natural sciences, or alchemical findings that would have surely secured a sticky end for the original author should it have fallen into the wrong hands at the time of composition. The only clue that Voynich had as to the manuscript's origin was a letter tucked inside its pages, which seemed to date the bizarre codex to at least the 16th century. The letter stated that the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II had once bought the book for 600 ducats, the equivalent of about 100,000 US dollars today. 
One of the first academics to tackle the text was a professor of philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, William R. Newbold. He reported that minuscule signs on the vellum, visible only through a microscope, seemed to be a form of shorthand which, when decoded, produced an inflammatory text in Latin about germ cells and organic life. This sensational theory was discredited just ten years later, when a former colleague of Newbold came to an entirely different conclusion, condemning the so-called minuscule shorthand as merely residues and cracks in the old vellum pages. In time, the codex fell into the hands of leading British and American wartime codebreakers. In the early 1950s, an informal team of National Security Agency cryptographers analysed the manuscript, attempting to uncover its meaning using the letter-based cipher theory. They, like many others who have studied the book, were unable to provide answers as to its meaning. Even computer programs designed for decipherment could not crack the code. After many extensive studies by various individuals and teams, it has been found that the manuscript contains more than 170,000 glyphs, most written with one or two simple pen strokes. An alphabet of between 20 and 30 unique characters were identified as comprising the majority of the text, not including a few rare glyphs which appeared only once or twice. The vellum pages of the mysterious document have been radiocarbon dated to the early 15th century, and is widely believed to have been written in Italy. This revelation has led some to credit the Renaissance enigma to Giovanni Fontana, a 15th century Italian physician and engineer. Others have named Leonardo da Vinci as the text's original author. Some have looked beyond Renaissance Italy and to the court of England's Elizabeth I, and those with occult interests, including the Elizabethan mathematician, philosopher and astrologer John Dee. Another theory is that if no one can unravel the mystery of the manuscript, then perhaps it had no meaning in the first place. Some more cynical observers have pointed the finger at Wilfred Voynich, claiming that he fabricated the manuscript himself in the early 20th century. However, as radiocarbon dating has proven consistency of the pages, indicating origin from a single source, modern forgery is effectively ruled out, as it is highly unlikely that a quantity of unused vellum comprising at least 14 or 15 entire calfskins could have survived from the early 15th century. Not only that, the idea of the text being a hoax, renaissance or modern, suggests a commitment to trickery above and beyond the usual. Far from being an unsophisticated deception, we know that the language of the manuscript displays reasonable sentence structure, meaning that it is not merely a random assortment of symbols. It certainly appears that the great volume's pages do conceal some sort of knowledge. For all the detailed analysis and proposed theories, academics are still mystified. Despite the efforts of hundreds of expert codebreakers, interpreters, historians, philosophers and linguists, no one has yet succeeded in decoding the Voynich manuscript. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video then why not watch another on ancient mysteries suggested on screen now. Don't forget that you can also follow me on social media. Until next time.